So this is some instructions for creating panoramas. The latest version of Lightroom includes a powerful feature to create panoramic shots. It can be found under the photo menu and then select the photo merge option. We are going to merge four shots of the harbor in Valletta on the island of Malta. Some early morning light can be seen nicely illuminating the old harbor buildings. Start by applying some adjustments to the first picture. Choose the develop module. Then adjust the exposure to suit the scene. We could add a little contrast. Move the dehaze slider to the right. Add some clarity and texture. When you're happy with the results, return to the library module. Then in the grid view, highlight all four images and sync the settings so all of the images have the same adjustments. Now, with the four pictures still selected, choose Photo, then Photo Merge, then Panorama. You will see Lightroom working hard to generate a preview of the final panorama. There are three options. The projection can be spherical, cylindrical, or perspective. Spherical and cylindrical seem to work well in most cases. We will choose cylindrical. Tick the fill edges box. And as if by magic, Lightroom does just that. It fills the edges. Now, click merge to build the final panorama. This is quite a processor intensive operation. So you will see a progress bar near the top left of the screen. And on completion, I defy anyone to detect the joins. The final panorama is a digital negative or DNG file and preserves all the detail of a raw file when you take it into Photoshop to finalize your picture. <coughs> Okay, so that's just a, a quick overview of um, creation of a panorama. I thought I'll, I'll just do another one and do it a bit more slowly. And um, so you, you can always revisit that video in your own time if you want to have a, another look at the instructions. But uh, I know you'd go away disappointed if you didn't see some pictures of Concord. So I just thought I'd show... <laughs> I'm going to call my son through. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I'd show... Um, Which one I... is it, Phil? This, this one is the one at Yeovilton. This is one of the prototypes at Yeovilton. And um, this was taken on my tour of all of the British Airways, or at least the British Concorde. So I've seen all of the UK exhibits now. So I've just got uh, the, the, the one in Seattle, New York, and Barbados to go. So look forward to those, I think. Um, what I'm going to do is just, I'll, do, I'll choose two images that I'm just going to stitch together uh, to form a panorama. So what you do is you select the two images you're going to stitch together. Um, I won't bother with any adjustments like they did in the video, but I'll just demonstrate the use of the different um, projections. So you go up to photo and photo merge, and then choose the panorama option. Okay, and with that selected, you'll see It's working a little bit slowly through Zoom, but it's working very hard to produce a preview of the panorama. And um, the video was actually done on my Mac and it's so quick on the Mac. Um, so the, the delay was sort of hardly um, evident, but you can see here, I've got the cylindrical um, projection selected. And you just imagine those two photographs being selected on the, the inside of a cylinder. And this is the sort of the, the, the effect you get. You can try the spherical one. Not much different. I think the wings of this 
biplane or has uh, started to bend a little bit. So I think the, the cylindrical one is better, possibly. Mm, it looks a bit taller to me. I think the spherical one I'm going to is the one I'm going to go with. Uh, perspective is an interesting one. It, it works quite well on a landscape because what it tries to do is to use the middle shot um, to, to predict the perspective on, on the end shots. But if I try perspective on this one, it makes a real mess of it because there was no middle shot. So definitely that's not one to use where you've got two shots. So I'm going to go with cylindrical. Um, there's very slight differences in there. I think I'm actually going to go with spherical. And then this option here is to fill the edges. So these white areas here can be filled in with um, part of the photograph that matches. And it's so clever. The roof there is really, really spot on. I think this aircraft down here in the, the bottom um, right-hand corner has been messed up a bit, but I might, I might crop that out or might edit that later in, in Photoshop, but it does really produce a very, very good job of it. Um, you can create a stack of images so that um, it combines the, the, the two component images with the, the panorama in one stack on, on the, uh, the Lightroom library, but uh, I'm going to untick that and just merge it. And through um, Lightroom and through Zoom, this process is actually quite slow, but uh, it's much quicker when you've got less running. Um, but this, I, I was stunned at the results. I thought I couldn't do a better panorama than you can do on your mobile phone. The iPhone, you can just sort of um, move it horizontally across a scene, and it seems to produce brilliant panoramas, except occasionally if there's a person walking across the scene, you kind of get the odd foot or something um, appearing in the scene. So there's my completed panorama. I didn't produce a stack, so it's produced it as a third image there, which is actually a DNG image, uh, a DNG file. And that does preserve all the detail that's in a, um, a raw file. So when you take it into Photoshop, it actually takes it into the Photoshop uh, raw editor, I think. Um, you can see there's a little bit of something going on there, but it's not too bad in the bottom right-hand corner. But the stunning thing is, if you go back to the original pictures, I've got the words aerospatial and the, the top of the, um, the, the, the wings of that biplane clipped on that image. And on that one, I've got aerospatial seen in full again. So somewhere the join is, is in this area in the middle below that biplane. So I'm just going to have a look at the panorama up close. And I cannot detect it. It just takes a little while to catch up with filling in the detail there, but I can't detect where the join is at all. It really is very good. So somewhere along that fuselage of the aircraft there is a join. And I've studied it and I can't find it. The, the join, Phil, is not, um, it's not like we used to do. It wouldn't be a straight line. No. It will, it will literally, it will eat its way around individual pixels and it will form a, a jagged line if you like. So really? It's actually <laughs> pixel perfect and it's drawing around individuals. So it's not just a straight line that it's merging together. It's actually drawing a ragged line all the way around. Um, and it, it, it's even better. The reason this is so processor hungry is that it, so ex you were showing there and quite rightly, you were showing there the, the Aerospatiale France. Both of these or that these letters appear on both images, but relatively speaking, they'll be in different places on both images and they will be at different perspectives and sizes and maybe even zoom levels and what have you. Yeah. 
it's it the... works all that out and it, it warps the images and shrinks them and expands them and it moves all the images around as well, even although there's just two here. And then it kind of it it rearranges, it makes sure that everything lines up and it's on a pixel by pixel basis. So if you're on a 30 odd megapixel image and you put two of them together, you're on a 70 odd, 80 odd megapixels. Yeah. It's actually working it out. Now, if you take, I, I've got a group of, um, I think there's seven images and they're 43 megapixels each and it stitches it together and it's, and it's perfect. And that's why it's so processor hungry. So you don't have a straight line join. You you have a, a join that goes round the really? cells. He's and very, it's very warped clever. on the images to make sure that everything lines up. So it's, it's extremely processor hungry. Um, but it is, it's a fabulous thing. It's absolutely it is, fabulous. It's the, the, the best tool for, for creating a panorama I've seen. The reason the car is in there, I did wonder whether I could uh, apply the panorama tool to that car, which is a sort of focus stacked um, shot, but uh, it didn't work. Um, you can you can do it by, uh, I think what you have to do is uh, edit in and then use this one open as layers in Photoshop and then use the Photoshop tools to, to stack. So it, it allows you to prepare them, but that was what I was trying with that one. Just want to show one more um, panorama and uh, it uses the, pan, uh, the perspective tool, this one. This is a scene shot as a cruise ship was pulling into um, the, the Spanish city of Cadiz. So once again, I'll, I'll just highlight those three. I've just noticed that, that, that one on the right, the sky's a little bit darker than the others. So I'm just going to make some adjustments ah, in I, the develop can module. I, can I still is it be worth there? doing? Can I still be there as well? Yeah, Phil? sure. Um, I, I noticed the, the female's voice. I don't know how you did that. That was quite clever. Yeah, it was a good impression of a, yeah. It was good, yeah, I'm it? impressed at that. It's, uh, the, the, there's no need to develop the images inside Lightroom. Um, and this is, I think this is unique to Lightroom. You don't need to pre-develop your images, even if they're all wildly off. Just put them together as a panorama because you've still got a raw image at the end of the Oh, day. right. So if you've got three raw images, all you're doing is producing a fourth raw image and the blending of tones is one of the things that it does as well. So not only does it oh, right. jiggle so all your perspective and move things around yeah. and then stitch them up, but it also blends all your tones very subtly. So you don't need to pre-develop do your panorama and then do the developing afterwards. Um, it really, it wouldn't make any difference whether you pre-develop or not, but it's just, it's one last step. That's brilliant. So that, that will demonstrate it actually, if, if the tones are adjusted as well, that one is clearly a little bit darker yeah. than the other two. So what I'll do is I'll select all three by holding the shift key and then select number three, and then we'll go up to photo, photo merge, panorama and um, it produces a preview okay that's the spherical version of it what I noticed here is that harbour wall in the distance is slightly curved and um, if I click on the perspective projection I think that has sorted it out largely Mm -hmm. And so, sure enough, that third picture, the tones mm -hmm. are pretty much the same, aren't they? So what you've got here at this point, you don't actually have your panorama finalised yet. It's taken your three thumbnail previews and it's yeah. blending yeah. those together. So all you have here is a thumbnail preview, basically, times three. And then when you click on the, the go button, at, at the bottom, that's when the processor, you'll hear the fan going, and that's when the processor really <laughs> starts to go to work. Um, okay. The filling edges, I was going to say to you as well, when, what I always teach is, when you're taking your panorama images, I the expression I use is shoot them loose. So make sure that you've got a lot of rubbish at the top and a lot of rubbish at the bottom that you're not going to keep then the fill edges will work. 
Yeah. But if if you need those edges to be accurate at the, the end of your image, then fill edges with a sky it'll work perfectly, with the water it'll work perfectly, but where yeah. you have a complex and a lot of clutter, it won't always work perfectly. So what I always tell people to do is just zoom out and just have rubbish at the bottom and rubbish at the top, and then your fill edges will work a treat. Work right. Perfectly. I noticed there's, a, there's yeah. a little structure which is part of the ship as we're pulling into Cadiz. So when I do fill edges, I suspect that is going to stay where it is. <laughs> <laughs> Which can easily be removed. So I'll remove that at some stage. Um, can I just show you what it looks like if you create stack? Because it, it sort of really just keeps your, your screen less cluttered in the library module. So I'll merge that now. And you can see um, Lightroom's working very hard to create the panorama. But those one, two, three images that we're, we're using as the constituent parts of this um, panorama will now form a stack, hopefully. It does take longer when you're running Zoom and you're recording. When you're running through Zoom, it, it takes yeah. quite a bit longer, doesn't it? It does. I'm just singing the praises of the, uh, the, the Apple Mac. It was instant on the Apple Mac, this process. Really good. It's a fairly new one. Is it the M1 chip? Uh, yes. Yeah. Apple, Apple the new Philly. version of Lightroom, because the new version is, is tuned for the M1, whereas it, it wasn't before. <laughs> so just talk amongst yourselves while Lightroom is working very hard through Zoom. The, eventually... the other thing then um, I was going to mention was you'd, you'd said there that you could take a phone and you can sweep it and create a panorama, but you, you're still limited to your number of pixels on your sensor. Yeah. Thing. Whereas if you have a look at this when you've finished it and you have a look at the number of pixels that you have in your final image because you've taken three and put them together um, and your final image will be massive. Um, so that image number four will be huge compared to the other individual ones. Oh, yes. Look at the... Um... The size of the pixels there. So if you keep that, keep that in screen for me and I will tell you what that is. Um, so what have we got there? 14,484. 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, that's quite something. I'm also uh, amazed that I was up at quarter to six in the morning to take that photograph. <laughs> there it is. And um, you're quite right. The, the, the filling the, of the water is really, really good. You yeah. see, it's just loading here. So we haven't got the full resolution of the image. But the What's water on the... It's a 62 megapixel image. <laughs> yeah. The water is is perfectly filled. We'd, we'd remove that with um, either the healing brush in Lightroom or healing brush in, um, in Photoshop at some stage. But I'm just going to take that into the develop module just to make one adjustment to it. Um, I get the sense that that horizon isn't quite straight. So a really useful tool in the cropping tool is this thing. This thing that looks like a, uh, a spirit level is um, to straighten it up. So what you do is the horizon you want to be straight. So suppose I want that harbour wall to be straight. I just draw along it and you can see straight away it turns the image slightly um, anti-clockwise to straighten it for me. Can I... Can I chip in here? Yeah, oh, sure. Can you go back to the crop tool. If you yeah. And press reset for me. Yeah. One is, no, 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 oh, no, 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 not, not, <laughs> not that, that one. reset. Oh, can, no. do control Z, do control Z for me. Okay. Okay. Right, it's reset in the crop tool. Down a wee bit. Oh, yeah, I've got it. Right. 
see just above there you've got an auto button yeah click yeah. that and i think you'll be amazed <laughs> it does the same thing nearly it yeah. nearly it, did it i think it's probably using the buildings to be honest yeah i mean the, the um that harbor wall wouldn't really be straight i don't think no i know um, be, but the, the the certainly the horizon's now straight isn't it yeah so good now this is a massive image so if i do control e to take it into photoshop i suspect we'll be here for quite a while but i won't do that you but you that, would get enough pixels to get rid of that with the the healing brush tool in lightroom it'll it'll do that perfectly you get, get rid of the cells to play with There we go. Job done. The funny thing is, in club competitions, we never ever see panoramas because when they're projected onto the screen, you just get this very narrow band of image and you really can't see the detail in it. The only, and, and the same with a print. Um, really, the only use for these things is to, to produce a huge print for your wall. A, a, a very um, geeky thing to tell you is that Hollywood worked us out years ago. Um, and it was, believe it or not, it was a, a bloke in Hollywood called Charlie Chaplin. Oh, yeah. Who was not only a funny man that walked about with a moustache, but he was actually a genius in some of the, the, the stuff that he used to produce. And he worked out that a ratio of 2.39 is the best for a panorama image. Um, and that was where the cinema screen and all the rest of it came from after oh, that. Right. And he'd worked it all out. So 2.4, 2.5, that kind of idea, if you like, inside um, Lightroom um, or at any panorama that you're producing. So very rarely do I go a three to one. I usually do a two and a half or a two, two to one. Um, but 2.39 is what he worked out which is very very precise but i don't know what's I, I use the panorama tool quite a lot and I, i'm glad you showed the concord um example there because people think of panoramas as this a, a, a large vista you know yeah a skyline um or a landscape or whatever but they're they're very useful for indoors and they're very useful if you have say a 50 millimeter lens and you wish you'd brought your 35 mil lens with you. Yeah. Put your back to the wall and just take three or four images and come in here and produce it. Um, and, and remember you can do the exact same thing going vertical. Yes, of course. You don't just need to go side to side. You can actually go vertical as well. Um, and it'll work it all out. I don't know why, but in the library module there, it's just suddenly showing a very, very grainy image. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, going back into the develop module, I've still got the, the sort of full detail there, but maybe it's just showing a, a preview in the library module because it's just such a massive file. Yeah, the, there's, a, there's a thing in your preferences um, to do with your preview files. Oh, yes. And it measures the size of your monitor. And if you're projecting through Zoom just now, your monitor will be at 1080 by 1920. Oh, that's right. What your monitor is. Um, so it takes that, it measures that, and then it tones it down. And it gives you, it's just to speed up the whole preview yeah. process. It, it only seems to be uh, visible in the library module and not the develop module. Yeah. But it's a lovely place, Cadiz, if you ever get the chance to visit near Seville and um, it really is a, a, a stunning place. You can see the cathedral in the center at the heart of the city, it's lovely. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. And um, if anybody would like to chip in with any questions or comments, please feel free. If anybody has any tips to share themselves, you should be able to share your screens. I really found that it was a revelation the panoramic shots because yeah. you know I've, I've struggled in photoshop to try and merge layers together in the past and like martin said you can't do it with just sort of straight lines you've got to sort of 
try and select parts of the image that you're going to merge and very time consuming and you never get such a good result as that. No, I did. I, I remember when it, it came in, I, I, I can't remember how long ago it was. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm off here away looking to see if I've got, there, there was one, the whole set of panoramas, but it doesn't matter. Um, I, I remember when it came out, we're, we're going back a few years, um, the HDR and the panorama, and um, I, I was amazed with panorama because I used to use Photoshop and I, I had learned this trick about not drawing a straight line and merging them, but actually drawing, so drawing round a tree and drawing round a building and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, so I would do that in Photoshop and it, it was, a, you know, it was get a cup of coffee and sit down and take your time to do this properly. Um, and then it came out and I was quite proud of the ones I used to produce. And I used to sometimes print them and I take them to people and other photographer friends and they'd say, right, go and spot, spot the join, I dare you, I dare you. Um, and then this came out in Lightroom and it was just click here, click there, and that will be do it all for you. Yeah. God. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> and they're HDR as well. I don't know if anybody's used it for HDR, but um, it does a fabulous HDR. Um, I haven't used that. Um, oh, HDR. it's it's magnificent and it produces an HDR that does not look like a cartoon. Um, you know how a lot of yeah. HDRs look like a bowl of a bowl of puke, a bowl of sick, basically. Um, well, they, this one doesn't. It looks completely natural. Um, give it a try. I think you'll be really amazed at it. Um, if you know how to set your camera up, just to shoot the three shots automatically for you. Um, or five shots, depending on what kind of camera you've got. Um, but the HDR again is wonderful as well. And again, don't you don't need to pre-process. So if you've got HDRs, don't pre-process them. You know you're under your your Goldilocks exposure and you're over. Yeah. Um, don't pre-process them. Just take them into the HDR, merge to HDR, then process it after because you've still got a raw file. Um, and the same with the panorama, you don't need to pre-process. Just take right. it straight in. That's and useful to know. It does it it did it for us, didn't it? Yeah. With because you could see that right hand image was uh, certainly a little bit darker. Yeah. No, it's 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 brilliant for that. It really is brilliant. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Yes, I've got um <coughs> a question. No tips, I'm afraid. No tips at all. Or just questions. Um when the develop module and I was developing some uh, landscapes. And when I was using the linear gradient, I was ending up with a lot of halo, a halo effect. Um, and I'm wondering what I'm doing wrong. Have you got an example you can show us, Jenny? Can you, can you share your screen, Jenny? Um, got... I'm using my <laughs> iPad. <laughs> uh, so I could, uh, but I'd need to join you on my um shall i yes. if i shared my screen would you talk me through yeah yeah certainly yeah. That, that might work mm. um i'll go back to um the library module so that the image that i was trying to uh, develop was like a, a a woodland scene so there was a tree line with sky and as I brought the gradient in, it just left it so crazy full of, of halos. Is it a JPEG uh, or a raw image? No, raw, no, it's raw, none of it's JPEG. Raw. Were you were you really having to throw the sliders to get the look that you were going for? Or was it um no, I was trying to uh tone it down, uh trying to get the um sky a bit. Uh, lower um, in intensity and um, it just uh, I mean what I can do Phil is send you the image for you to load oh yeah you could do that if you could email should I try me. that should I try yeah. that okay That's... well I will just try and find it and send it to you Phil so just yeah. talk amongst yourselves okay but I, do... I, just thought that I haven't got I... very many photographs in this library because um, this is just on my Windows laptop, and uh, mm. I've just created a sort of little model library to play around with for these sessions. So I haven't really got very many photographs at all on it. 
Okay, I'll send it to the usual address, Phil. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. And I can pick that up. Hmm. In the meantime, Phil. We can see your yeah, email. sure. You I wonder know, if you know your email now. Yeah. Sorry. I'll just I'll just stop the share. Yeah. And I'll pick up my emails. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, it'll, be, it'll be a couple of minutes, so Kevin, please go okay. for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is what one for Martin really. I, I mentioned it to Phil a week ago. I noticed the other day I'd exported an image as a JPEG, but then was still looking at the image in Lightroom. But mm -hmm. when I then looked at the image in for example, Explorer, and I also tried in Affinity. Yeah. There were different brightnesses. Yeah. But this was the same image. Yes. So well, Windows Explorer um, is not... Windows Explorer is not to be used for um, colour grading or exposure setting or whatever. Windows Explorer, there... There is, it will come to me as well, as I'm talking, there is one that you can download free um, and it's colour balanced. That's what I was looking for. It's colour and tone balanced. Windows Explorer is not. Right. Windows Explorer is actually tuned to make, to work with mobile phone images and make them look um, wow. So Windows Explorer is definitely always going to make things look more saturated. Right. Plus, Windows Explorer will recognise any um, nighttime mode you have on your computer screen. So if at night time that it starts to remove blue slowly from your screen and make it more red, Windows Explorer will play with that. Um, Affinity, one of the, the drawbacks of Affinity is that it's not colour toned and colour balanced either. Right. Okay. Um, and again, I think, although I've not tested this, but I think Affinity will respect your nighttime mode on your computer also. Okay. Lightroom mm. does respect the, the, the nighttime modes, but not to such a high degree. So if your nighttime mode's at 50% of the full setting, because it's a kind of gradual thing, it doesn't just switch on instantly. Um, so if it's a kind of 50% of its setting, Lightroom will only be showing you like 20% of it and what have you. So you'll always get that difference. If you sit and you look at an image in Lightroom and then you open the same image in Explorer or anything else, um, yeah. it will look different. Okay. So, so if I can find if I can find the night the nighttime setting on the monitor, should I switch it off? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, if I take it, it's a Windows machine you're using. Uh, yeah. 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 So I think yeah, there you are. So if you press, if you press the Windows key on your keyboard, and just start to type the word night. So just press the Windows key and type night. And yeah. You'll see there and, you uh, and you can go in there and just switch that off. Yeah. Uh, yes. It's it's set at a hundred percent. <laughs> there they are. Excellent. <laughs> oh, thank you. Right, so ah, so would that affect how you colour calibrate your your monitor then, depending on what time that, of day you do it? Yes, absolutely. And, and that's why um I always tell people when you're editing a photograph, look at the histogram, don't look at your monitor. You've got to edit your photographs by the histogram, not your monitor. Right. Okay. Well, that's really useful. Thank you, Martin. A, a small trick. If I can just share my screen here. Um, yeah, you should be able to share your screen. I, oops, where am I? Um, I'll show you a small trick. It's not 100% correct, but it will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Is that coming through? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So any image, let me take this one here. Um, Amy. Any image will come into develop module. So if I move myself out the road here, if we come up and we look at the histogram here, up here, if you look at the right hand side of the histogram, ignore all the rest, but if you look purely over at the right hand side, 
do you see we've got red and yellow separated and then yep. they all kind of all the other colors like green and cyan and magenta they all blend and that's just shown as gray when they all blend equally or they're mm -hmm. all blending but this red and yellow sticking out of the right hand side means that your image has a red yellow tinge to it now if i take this temperature slider and i turn it left towards the blue have a look at the right hand side of this histogram as i do that so as i turn dial this down see how those red and yellow start to join up and then as i go to the red they separate out it's this part here that determines the tone the, the look if you like of your image so as i drag that down it becomes they join up and technically speaking once they have joined that should color corrected it properly and then as i go to the right they've separated out again and right enough i do have a red yellow tinge and as i bring it back they join up and you can see i've got a bit of blue poking out now and if you look at the image it is blue and if i move to the right and take that blue away then i'm getting a more balanced um, colour tone. So not only can you do the exposure using a histogram, but you can also do your colour balance, if you like. Um, just so I want it slightly warm, and that's just slightly warm, and I can see just by looking at the right-hand side here. It really doesn't matter what's going on here. That's just really to do with brightness values. But this bit at the extreme right-hand bottom edge is where your colour balance, if you like, comes from, or your tonality. Does that make sense? Is that yeah, yeah, that's very good. And if I, I click on this one, you'll see that I've got more blue at the right hand side. So I've got blue and then I've got cyan. And if I warm that up, I should be able to pull them all together until they join up. And once they've joined up around about there, then we probably have a more equally balanced image. It's technically balanced but aesthetically it's not balanced in my opinion so that that's why it is it's blue so there, there's a difference between you can you can look at this and you'll get the technical information but the aesthetic information is here in the screen if you like yeah, yeah thank you that's, that's really interesting if i've got jenny's picture now but before we move on to jenny's picture martin could you just run through very quickly the calibration um, section in develop because that's got some similar sort of adjustments of colors, isn't it? Oh, quite... yes, sorry, right down here. Yeah, that's yeah. one I haven't really explored much, but it seems let to... me. I think if I click on this one, um, let me come up here. Has this been developed at all? Right, I'm just going to cheat and hit the auto button here just for speed. And again, if you look at the right hand side, you can see you've got a, a lot of yellow tones. So let me pull that down so that it's more technically balanced, if you know what I mean. So we will see about there. Um, and if we come down to calibration, it's one that's very rarely used. And I don't go into it a lot because I think it causes more confusion than I, I can actually help people with. But um okay so what does it do so it, you've got the 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 headings at the top of each slider so we've got a red our rgb a red green and blue and we've got our shadows in the tint and that's easy enough so in the shadows i can put a green or a magenta tint into the shadows okay so that's easy enough that's not much different from what we're doing up above it's slightly different but not much so the reds, what you can do is you can change the hue of the reds by a small amount. So you keep them within the red part of the color wheel. You don't take the reds and make them green or make them blue, but you take the reds and you either make them an orangey red or a pinky red. And so if I take this hue slider and I drag it to the left, you can see that the reds over here, for example, have become We'll call it a pinky red, and if we go over here, they've become an orangey red and yellowy red. So they're still within the red, but I can I can swing them um, slightly. 
And then once I do that, I can also, no matter where this is in the hue slider, I can then increase the saturation purely um, for that hue. And you can see, if you look over here at the autumn colours, you can see it's having quite a profound effect on them. Now, it's different from HSL, because HSL, if you look at it, we have got, what is that, eight sliders we've got in here, and there is less rollover between the colours. So there's less of a bleed from red into orange and less of a bleed from orange into yellow and so forth. But down in the calibration tab, because we've only got our RGB, what it's basically doing is it's picking up from the raw information from the, the RGB filters that were on your sensor. And there's a lot of bleed between the colors. So the red will have parts, bits of green in it, and it will have bits of blue. So there's quite a lot of um, rollover and crossover between the two of them. And you might think, oh, well, that's a bad thing because I can get a finer adjustment up above. And it's probably not a bad thing because the more bleed that you've got between areas of an image, the less it shows, the less of a join you have, the less obvious the, the differences are. So that's, that's the red one. Green works exactly the same way. I can make the greens a bit greener. And if we look at the grass here, it becomes very green or I can put a lot of yellow into the green um, or I can take yellow out of green. And again, I've got saturation. The blue one is the one that I find very interesting. And obviously, if we look at the sky, if I take the blue and I do that, I can add more purple to it or I can add more um, teal um, into it. And the blue one's the one that I like. And I find this very interesting. And here's a wee trick. If you've got any photographs that have got autumn colours in it, if you take this blue slider and you drag it to the left, just watch the autumn colours in this image. And as I drag that to the left, why are they becoming red when I'm dragging the blue slider? And some, if I go all the way, I've got an orange and teal photograph. And if I tone that down and I come up, um, oops, where am I? Come up to a basic panel and I take the vibrance down, I've now got a teal orange effect on a photograph purely by using this blue slider. Um, I'll just put them both back there. Let me take um, this vibrance and just put it back to something. So back down here, the blue slider is the one I always tell people, go, go to the blue slider first. And if you want to add saturation to an image, again, without making it look like a 1970s rented television, um, come down to the blue slider, take the saturation and turn that up. And it adds a bit of saturation to every single color in the image. And as I go backward and forwards, you can see it there. Take that up. And then if it's autumn colors, take this one to the left a tiny wee bit. And there we are. So simply by taking, I'll switch this on and off. And all I've done is move the blue slider, separated them apart, and that's without, and that's with. And because we have such a huge rollover between the colours, you're never actually going to see any joins. You're never going to see <coughs> that um, effect taking place. And this is how this um, orange teal is done in Lightroom. And if you ever buy any presets for it, that's all they're doing is they're just taking this down. And there's your orange and teal there, around about there. Um, and if that's a look you like, then fabulous. Um, if it's not, or we can make it as subtle and what have you. But the blue slider is a great one. I play with that quite a lot, especially with autumn colours. I'm giving away a lot of secrets here. Um, especially with autumn colours, I will usually put them just round about there. And if I switch that off and on, you can see the difference it's made. And it just gives the autumn colours a bit of punch and everybody's doing that, all the pros are doing that. When you buy a calendar and you've got your autumn colours in Canada and all the rest of it, that's what they've done. They've, they've tweaked these kind of things. Um, you, you could have done it in Photoshop, you still can, but Lightroom with this calibration tool 
um, it's very easy to do. And then I can come up and if I think there's too much yellow in the grass, I can drag that over and that makes the grass a bit more green and what have you. So certainly come down here and, and play with it, but always start with the blue slider. Um, and even if you don't change the hue of the blue, change the saturation of the blue. Um, and I, I think you'll find it that makes quite a lot of, it adds a nice contrast and punch and what have you. But if you want to make autumn colours pop, then drag the blue to the left. Don't Thank ask you. me why that works. I haven't a clue. Um, but Thank you. That was really useful because I've, I've been playing around with that, finding there were some quite nice effects and quite subtle effects there. But I didn't quite know how it differed from the... Uh, the uh, the HSL um, yeah it, it's really good um, I'm trying so yeah here's a, an example so if I come into this blue sky and I roll the mouse over it look at the histogram as I roll the mouse over here into the image so there we have red green and blue and this area of the blue sky is 65.8 percent red and it's 75.4 percent green and the blue is 82.5%. So slightly more blue, but there's still a hell of a lot of red in that. So, and this is what these RGBs do. So there's a huge amount of rollover between the pixels and every single pixel will be adjusted if you use these. Whereas if I use the HSL, it will not adjust every pixel. And eventually somewhere you're going to have a boundary and that boundary might be visible. But using this, the boundary is never visible. Um, it can't be because every pixel is adjusted. That's excellent. Thank you. That answers my question. Now, what I can't do is get my Zoom to work. I cannot unshare my screen. Oh. You might need to do it for me, Phil. Um, yeah, I, I can stop you. Oh, I've lost. Hold on a minute. I can that's stop better. you. Yeah, that's better. That's I'm just going problem. to retreat. I'm just going to retrieve uh, Jenny's photograph. Yeah. And, um, and then I can share it on the screen. And, and Jenny, if you could talk me through <laughs> some instructions for, for what you I hope that was a dog. <laughs> oh, no, cat. A <laughs> cat. Oh, well. Mm -mm. Sorry. Um, I just saw a bum. It was hard to tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely an animal. Um, yeah, so if I, if I share yeah. my screen now, I should be able to. Um, sorry. Right. If I import that into Lightroom. <clears throat> See, before you do, Phil. Sorry? You, before you do, if you yeah. go back to your desktop, I'll show you a wee trick. I don't think I've mentioned yep. this in the course. See your image. Drag yep. it on top of the Lightroom icon. Ah, okay. Open up Light. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Open Lightroom, maybe. Okay, you're in the library module. It should work. Um, just drag it in. Oh, and yeah. Let go. And let go. And that will import it for you. Oh, that's it. That's done it. So it's a JPEG because I couldn't send um, a raw too big to go on the, in the email. Um, and um, obviously it needs a fair bit of cropping. So <laughs> should, if I take it to... <laughs> into develop, yeah. Into develop module. Yeah. And then when I came to put a, a, a linear gradient on it, so that's um, in the, the masks it's, and then a linear yeah. gradient. You uh, drag that down from the top. Yeah, yeah. And then I was trying, what I was trying to do with the radial, sorry, the linear gradient was to reduce, just make it a bit darker. Obviously, it's a bit lighter at the top there. And, uh, and so, therefore, reducing the highlights and so on. But it just ended up with a lot of purple uh, fringing um, halos. Now, it, it may be the original photograph is the problem, you know, um, but I just wondered how, what I, whether, it, whether I could avoid yeah. it. See your mask um, controls there. 
film yeah. that we see at the very top, just to the right hand side of word mass. Yeah. Or to the left. See that white bar? You just keep going to the right. Yeah. White bar, grab that and just pull that off there. And there, that'll open up. That gives me a bit more space to yeah. work with. You can also drop your histogram if you want. Not that I ever recommend it. <laughs> if you just go to the very top of the word histogram and click on the small disclosure triangle to the right of that's it. the word histogram. That's yeah. It. That should give you a bit more space. So it's giving me a bit more screen space. So these are the controls I have for the linear gradient that I've selected. And if I reduce the exposure a bit, What else should I change? Well, I, I was, I didn't play too much with exposure. I was just dropping the highlights um, and, um, and increasing the shadows just to make it a little less glary. But if you look into the branches, you do have to really zoom in, but it, it, they're very purple. And it just, as I say, maybe the original image you know, the conditions were, it was early morning, it was misty. Um, so it, it just may be the original photograph was compromised simply by the, by the conditions, I don't know. Can you try over at zoom in to the right hand side for me, Phil, right to no, the right hand side top? Top right of the image, very top right. Yes, right there. Mm. Keep once, I've zo once I've zoomed into that part, is it? I can't hold the um... space bar. Hold the space bar, and that should let you scroll. Oh yeah. Oh yes. That's, I that's didn't know useful that. to know. I've always been so I frustrated didn't know about that. that. Yeah. So I is that the purple move. there? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So particularly against that. Um, that trunk on the right, which will come out. So I mean, in the end, I've just cropped the yeah. whole so top that, section. If you if you close your adjustment, your gradient, your linear gradient. Sorry, if you close that, um, just okay it and accept it. I think we need to that shoot. So no, no, done. So click on done. Just so click on done. Yeah. Right, and then scroll down until you come to. Over on the, no, no, over on the right hand side. If you scroll down your adjustments until you get to the chromatic aberration, the lens adjustments, basically. Keep going, keep going near the bottom. Lens corrections. <coughs> and tick remove chromatic aberrations for me. Yeah. And Go to manual. So at the moment you're on profile, which it's not picking up, <coughs> which is fair dues. Click on manual and then just scroll the image so we can see the offending area. So <laughs> seem to, there we go. There we go. That, yeah. And now see the amount slider for the purple at the top. Oh, yeah. oh sorry, this amount here. No, no, that's just a green the, one. Just about. Oh. Up, one yeah. more, one oh, more, yeah. that's you. Drag that to the right, there you go. Oh, oh yes. It's a miracle. <laughs> it, it's so subtle the way the changes occur. It's Well, I'm not so sure that is subtle, Phil. I mean, it was, it's gone. But, so yeah. that is... You've got such control over it, haven't you? Yeah. That is, in, in the, if you've got the raw image, as soon as you tick... Yeah, I mean, this is a JPEG because of the circumstances, but yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, as God. soon as you tick it, it should pick up the type of lens, but if it doesn't go to manual and drag that, and that is... Uh, it's just to do with pure physics, and it's to do with the lens. <laughs> and a very simple way to explain it is that on the front of our camera, we've got, and I don't know why to this day, but in the front of our camera, we've got a round lens, but the sensor is rectangle. So you're bringing light through a round object and um, 
putting it onto a rectangle. So in mm -hmm. the corners, you will have this darkening and you will have bending of light. And because the red light bends at a different rate from the blue light, they separate out by the time it gets to the corners. Now that's, that's amazing. And so presumably, if I've got a bit of green fringing, I can right. use the same... The, the you will have green yeah. fringing on yeah, the seen opposite it, yeah. side of the object. So you will have mm. red fringing on the left as you look at it, and you'll have green mm. on the right as you look at it. Mm. But if you've got the raw image, just ticking that box yeah. should be enough to get rid of. Yeah, no, I'm 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 on the raw image, and it's making a big difference. Yeah, good. Yeah, no, that's super. Thank you. You've that's really that good. That's great, lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. What one Thank thing, Phil, uh, uh, and I've forgotten exactly how you do it, but there is a setting where instead of you only open one of the right hand panels. Yes. When, when you click the yes. new one, it just opens that up and it That's makes right. it much easier to move up and down. Yeah. So on Phil's, yeah. see when you've got lens correction here, Phil. I'm pointing at my screen as I yeah. see what I'm doing. So if you if you come to the left of any one of them, so where you've got the word, it doesn't matter which one you pick. So come to the left of it in the, the area with nothing. So yeah. to the right, that's it. Right click and go to solo mode, and that changes. Oh, right. And if you look at the triangles to the right-hand side of the name of the panel, you'll see the triangles are made up of a series of dots. But if you go back and you right-click again, press solo mode, it's a solid triangle. Right. And you, can open, you can open more than one while it's a solid triangle, but when it's a dotted, triangle you can only open one at a time oh. does that make sense do you know what i mean by that oh yeah but if you oh. now click right click um in the kind of gray area go to solo mode you see the triangles change and they're a wee kind of dotted fill rather than um a solid fill and i'm sure i'm being dense but well, what's the advantage of that? What what, it, what does it do? It means you don't need to scroll up and down if you've got every single panel open. Oh, I see. Right, okay. It's on the laptop screen. I've got quite limited yeah. space, really, for these different menus. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, it's much better on the big screen, but um, that, yeah. that's that's helpful, isn't it? I didn't and know that. And if you come over to the left-hand side, Phil, where you've got your presets, snapshots, history, etc. Yeah. The exact same thing will work there. Oh, yeah. Solo mode. And you can see the triangles changed. Yeah. They changed to a solid triangle when the when solo mode is off, don't they? Yes. Yep. That's very that useful. Way, that lets you know that you, it's just one at a time that will open. And that's the way I have it set up in my laptop screen as well. <laughs> well, thank you for raising that point, Mike. That was really useful. Really good. Mm. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions they'd like to ask? Or I must say I'm very impressed with the uh, the updates with the masking. Of the, the the masking is just a revelation, isn't it? Can, can I can I show you something? That, yeah, sure. I'm sorry, it still makes me laugh. This this just blows me away. This is the kind of geek I am. Um, sorry, I, I I don't want to gate crash too much, but let me. No, no. I'll share my screen, and it's just since we're talking about this new mask, and I just want to show something, and it works with this. It works with any image, but um, I'll show you two images. So I'll show you this image, and I'll show you this image, and it's the select sky I want to show you. So here's one here. I'll come over, and I'll just click on select sky. It has a wee think about it, um, and... Yeah, it, it does does a wonderful job. I've got it, it set to the, the black and white. I'll put it as a, the usual color overlay. And I've changed my color overlay to magenta. 
because there's very few images have got the colour magenta in them. <laughs> there's lots of images that get red in them and lots of get blue, but very few have got magenta. So anyway, and it just works. Let it's me super, delete, let me delete this. So I'm thinking, well, how does this work? It's obviously analysing the top of the image and all the rest of it. So let's have a bit of fun. I'm going to right click, come down to transform, and I'm going to flip this vertically. The image is upside down and round the wrong way. Select sky. Watch <laughs> this. Boom. Can somebody explain how it's doing that? <laughs> isn't that just amazing? It, it, it's fabulous, isn't it? Is it just me? Or is, I mean, look at it. It's worked. How does it know? <laughs> I, I just, I, I'm sorry. I just think that's absolutely. <laughs> and even when you flip, it's still there. Look. It, it just, I just think that, and I've tried this in Photoshop and it doesn't work. Um, Photoshop just makes a mess of it if you flip the image. The other thing, um, this image here, and if I zoom in, uh, if I can I not zoom in, there we go. So if I zoom in, you can see in there I've got all your kind of, this is not chromatic aberration, it's making the trees, is this a low res? No, it must just be the screen sharing. Um, these, this is actually the, the sap rising, if you like, and the, the, the purple and what have you that comes in through the branches. So let me um, select sky here. And I just want to darken down the sky. But what I'll show you, so I can come in here and I can darken it. And you might think, oh, well, it's probably darkening the branches as well. But let me show you the mask with the white on black. And I'm going to zoom in. <laughs> now look at that. That is wonderful, isn't it? Uh -oh. That is just amazing. I mean, that's, to me, I just think that's Star Trek because I've wrestled with Photoshop <laughs> for so many years. Um, we're trying to select around bloody trees and what have you. And I was into luminosity masking and that works a treat, don't get me wrong. But, you know, to do this in a quick, one click. Like a fraction of a second. It's just phenomenal, I think. And the, the other lovely thing about this, if I zoom in here, it's extremely subtle, but what I want to show you here is we've got a roll off of this mask. So it has selected some areas in here, but you're not sky. And a lot of people have said to me, oh, well, it's not done a good job because it's got bits of the rock here. But this is to make sure, this is deliberate, and it's to make sure that you don't get a halo and a hard mm. transition. So we've got this gentle fall off all the way through. And we've selected snow. So if I change the colour of the sky, yeah. the reflection of the snow that. is going to change as it mm. would do anyway to reflect the sky. So it, it's not just selecting the sky, it's building in this roll off and I mean, there's never going to be a harder test for it than that. And it's absolutely, I, I just think it's completely um, mind-blowing. And I can come in here and, you know, muck about with a sky and change it. And, and it just, well, I mean, if I take it, sorry, if I take this to the extreme, um, I'll bring some blacks and we zoom in here. I've got a tiny halo beginning to appear, but I mean, I've, I've really pushed it. And I've just got a halo beginning to appear. But had it not been for this roll off, we would have a horrible hard line around here. Um, and you can see the snow is reflecting the colour in the sky as well, whereas this one isn't. Um, so it, it, it's not just as simple as, oh, it's selected the sky, but it, it's, it's selecting round. Anyway, I could go on about it for ages, but I, I just... It is superb. Just... Martin, how, before you leave that, how did you switch on the black and white view of that mask? Oh, sorry. Um, so just next to, if you click here, yeah. you can change the colour of your overlay. Um, and those three wee dots, 
you've got oh, yeah. different options. Um, so white on black is what you would have inside Photoshop, basically. That's the same kind of idea. Thank you. Colourly is the, the, the default one. And again, um, let me delete this and we'll have a bit of fun. Delete mask. I will transform and flip it vertically. So <laughs> let's guy. Look at that. <laughs> I, I, I just don't know how they're doing that. I just think that is fabulous. It's just a bit of fun, but it just shows you the the amount of processing that's going into that. And already I can hear my fan beginning to, to wind up a wee bit. Um, <laughs> but it, it's just, I think it's brilliant. I, I just thought I would share that with you because I, I thought that was really funny when I discovered it. Yeah, 